have to be very arrogant and admit I didn't really learn anything myself from the Mr. Beast camp because I thought a lot of their philosophies were the exact opposite of what I consider good content. You find before it was hard for you to sit through a Mr. Beast video? Uh, <laughs> I would prefer to have been grinding my and sanding my teeth. Okay. With Logan and it, or maybe also a little bit with Jimmy, I was getting the footage and I was being reactive. The footage was actually in charge. As I have been growing and maturing, I've been finding the intent of what I want the video to be and now I'm in charge. There's this one line in The Incredibles that I also live by and it's that thing of like, when everyone's super, no one is. And I kind of follow that same philosophy. When everything is fast, none of it is. I thought you were going to be like, where's my super suit? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I then did a big speech at an event called Vid Summit where I was like, hey guys, all the content you're making is shit and let me tell you why. And then Jimmy went, well, fuck you then. Put your money where your mouth is. Here's a job. Basically, Jimmy being the evil mastermind gave me a mortal enemy. And then it was like me and his job to be consistently every single day arguing on how the video should be edited. And then over time, we would then end up finding the middle ground. When I do see a cinematic drone opening shot that's not particularly related to the title and thumbnail, what that tells me is that you're prioritizing yourself as a filmmaker and showing off how good you are rather than actually telling me a good story. That's actually probably the biggest mistake. I do see putting ego as a filmmaker first rather than is this actually going to be a good story and content. Give me the one-handed crack. Okay. You ready? Swim time? So wait, wait, you didn't, you gotta sit down again. You're scaring me. Okay. Okay, pick it up and then, and then, yes, now go. And I'm gonna do a direct eye contact D to you. No way. Yes. Dude, Michael Jordan style, let's fucking go. Ooh. Oh, wow. a lot of splash. Dented. Oh my God. I even dented it. Like I was at Raging he Waters even here. I'll show you I like that he it. owned it. He was like, yeah, and I fucking oh, dented so it that's, too. See, see how that one was just perfect right around there? Oh, wow, Actually, you know what? Okay. Three, three, two on the one over here. Dude, I can't do yeah, this. this is like a 7-7. Seven, seven. <laughs> two, 2 And that one was awful. 1.5 new low record. <laughs> new low record from Cheers, Cheers, baby. Cheers, cheers. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give myself Eight points because corner. this, yes. you can see the effort. In yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, you can see. You can tell a human did that. We're just making robot. up rules and it's all good. Dude, thanks for coming out yes, here. Dude. Cheers, 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 cheers. Cheers. Uh, cheers, I just cheers. A nice drink. I like it. I'm going to get more of these. I'm mostly a LaCroix person, so I'm liking all these different versions. And you, yeah. you just yeah. got a lot of drinks out on the table. You're dialed in. Oh, yeah. I absolutely got this drink. I got my coffee. I got my water. The only thing that's missing is a whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> we can whip that up, dude. I think we can uh, get that happening. I can yeah. go for a whiskey. If we start getting deep and emotional, this is when we bring out the whiskey. <laughs> yes. The, if we need to. Make it really intense. Dude, so what, what have you been working on recently? What have you been cooking up in the lab? So I think it's been a really interesting past couple of years of me trying to navigate essentially this new step in my career. And I think I haven't quite committed to the singular direction just yet. I've just been experimenting with all of it. But right now, since I've spent the past few years building the business, I'm now getting back into actually editing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've just finished a, and so for me, it's that I've done the ringer. I've done the day to day grind, 12 hour days, doing a bunch of videos that we don't want to be doing. And so for me, approaching 30 i only want to be doing the videos that i'm excited to make hell that. yeah dude that's it's like about. i'm fed up of content that you're just obligated to do so what this means then is that maybe i'll only really work maybe twice a year Fuck yeah on big on big on deal, big, big stuff. projects yeah. take an extended napping. period of time. Yeah. yeah so if someone reaches out hey can you edit a short fuck off <laughs> <laughs> hey can you can you edit this vlog for me no nah, i've done that piss off uh -huh. you know like hey i've I, hey i've just filmed this amazing documentary we've had we, where we've done this 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 and this and i'm like oh this looks fascinating how long do you want me this is gonna be a two three month project let's fucking go nice i just want that deep stuff that gets me excited that gives me that really good reason while i'm waking up at 7 a.m and i'm like this is gonna be a really good creative day you're 7 a.m kind of guy you're not a late night we call those sketch boy hours the hours between like eh, 12 and <laughs> 3 so yeah. are you morning guy what's the vibe i think i want to be a morning guy but what it is around 11 around 11 or 12 my body is like that's it you're done that's mm. it go to bed and then and then i probably won't i'll struggle to get out of bed till like eight or nine i am an Same. eight hour a night guy if i do not get those eight hours that i'll write off that day straight away i'm fucked you and dude. billy would get yeah. along very well yeah. dude, <laughs> you, should, you should see my whoop score today it's like a 59 i'm like struggling i'm like can we 
postpone this podcast. Yeah, like, I didn't get a good sleep. <laughs> I've gotten sketchier, dude. You I'm have. staying up late. I'm waking up whenever, dude. Yeah. I'm like a little beat right now, but dude, podcast comes on. I'm Mr. Red Light. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I realized in the car. I was like, God, I'm out of it. But I'm Mr. Red Light, dude. I'm ready to go. Are you setting no <laughs> alarm just whenever? Dude, I've been kind of just like living the life. <laughs> so how, how do you think our, our dads do it? Because my dad, dude, 4 a.m. rolls around dude, and he just too. like levitates out of the <laughs> yeah. bed. And I'm just like, does that happen when you have 50 or what? I think, I think older, you don't need to really sleep. It's, mm. I think it's the younger you are, the more sleep you need for sure. <laughs> no, for real though. And then you get older. I think I must have just gotten old, dude. How old? How old are you guys? I'm almost 29, which is scary to Jesus. say. Mm, just That's kidding. Insane. I'm 28. I'm almost 29. Too, 26. Actually. I'm turning 30 next week. Oh, uh, but, but, dude, we yeah. really need the whiskey. Yeah, yeah. 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 celebrate early. But what it is, I think, what it was around t- around 28, 29. That's when my body just shifted. Great. Like I used to be the 2 a.m., 3 a.m. person, and then halfway through like 27, my body went, "All right, now you need those eight hours and go into bed before 11." 28 that age, man. It's sucks dude sir you also hate and you've edited for two of the biggest youtubers in in the entire world are you like the number one yeah the yeah. number one in mm. the second we got mr beast and logan paul and i want to dive right into it though and see kind of the differences between editing for the two of them because i was telling Costas before the show right you mm. see mr beast in my in my brain i have never worked with either of them right but i'm assuming this is the most analytical person of a youtube video and anything that he kind of says i was mm. listening to dan mace pod and he's like anything mr b says you're like not really going to question because this guy has put in so many years of analyzing <laughs> a youtube video that in a traditional sense of him being a filmmaker he's like oh if, it, if this creative says something i'm gonna be like no you're wrong right, like, right but with working with mr beast it's different and i'm assuming working with logan paul is also a very different dynamic so what was it like working for the two of them and what were kind of some of the key differences that you noticed during your tenure there the time that i was with jimmy he hired me to be the person to disagree with him Oh wow! God, and that's dope. Terrifying. I said that that was very fun, incredibly stressful, but also very fun. But then also with Logan Paul, I think he was also the person where he was very. The difference is, is this: Logan was very character and personality orientated, whereas I think Jimmy was very uh, spectacle and just content related. That was what he was excited and focusing on. And so in, in at that time, he was very focused on the spectacle, just the idea. And he wasn't so much focused on the character. He just wanted to give you something very cool to look at that has this optimized pace. Whereas Logan was the opposite where it was, let's just, I, I call this sort of um, sort of the garden chair theory, which is where Logan and his entourage and his team, they created such a great rapport and were very good at improv and comedy and just coming up with jokes just like that. Logan was able to put him and his team in the middle of a field with a simple garden chair and they'll be able to get an hour's worth of content just Mm. with that garden chair. Uh, If Jimmy was in that same circumstance with his team, they would probably find it very struggle and within maybe about 30 minutes, they would have bought a forklift and crushed it. (laughs) But uh, I think that was kind of the differences they were making. So it was character focused and then with Jimmy, it was more so like spectacle and big idea focused. With Logan Paul's videos as like this spectacle, this character, are you just like looking at the footage in a Dropbox and being like, okay, what's the story here? How can I put it together? Are they just filming kind of like a bunch of random stuff and you're trying to put together the story or were you kind of like talking to Logan and saying like, hey, you should maybe film it like this to make sure I'm getting these shots right. to lean mm-hmm. more into the Or do they like send you an outline or like, yeah. yeah. Pre-pro call, what's the vibe? Well, I think it is, there's two different eras that I would like to describe with Logan Paul. One was the daily vlogging era, which was, this was 2016 up to the start of 2018. And that was essentially, he would film anything and everything that he can, uh, send it to me across the world because I lived in the UK at the time. I don't know, open up my Dropbox, I have footage ready to go and then I didn't get that two hours of content or that he films and get it down to like 10, 15 minutes. So yes, there's lots of things being shaved. There's lots of things that are being cut. And then for me, it is bringing it into that focus of what what do I think is the best content? Now, I'd, now I will say 2016, 2017 content was a very different time period to what was considered good. You watch those videos now, they are awful. They are fucking garbage. <laughs> but then, like, I'm not cutting them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then that, and then the second sort of vlog era of Logan was what I called the quarant- the, what I call the quarantine vlog era. Can you see that I am good at podcasts because I correct myself yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, what I call the quarantine vlog era, which was again where similar thing. He would give me an hour or two's worth of footage every day, and I didn't have to get it down to five minutes. <sighs> 
and Fuck so that. but what what it is is that uh but logan and his team were very funny so there, there is so much things that we like ah this is not really as funny as we want it to be and we were following sort of the idea of it kind of being a bit more of like a highlight reel like it's, there's this rules of comedy where it's you got to get into the scene as late as possible and then you leave as soon as possible. And then what that then meant is, and so we follow that philosophy. And so it would be like, they would start improving a scene and they'll be going for about 10 minutes. I'm like, shit, 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 shit. Oh, that's a funny in. And mm. all that stuff's gone. It doesn't matter. It's gone. If Logan says he wants it back, fuck you, it's gone. You know, and so it was, and then I followed that out. And then as soon as I got like a great punchline, they will probably improv for another 10, maybe even 20 minutes. And I'd be like, nope, this is shit. It's all gone. I always came into the scene as late as possible and left as soon as possible. You also do something and you've talked about this about cutting quick 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 and mm. then like settling in on that mm. punchline can you talk about that editing strategy yeah i think it's one of my favorite strategies i think uh, earlier in my life i was a drummer and so i, I just like I, I originally wanted to be a musician at one point in my life and but it gave me a really great sense of rhythm and so i think it is if there is a specific joke or a very specific line that i think is the most important part I would set up the rules where I would have things be be cutting fast. And so maybe cuts go faster and faster and faster, or they have a very clear rhythmic pace. And so each cut I would specifically have be half a second, half a second, half a second, half a second. But then the line that I want everyone to focus on, that's three seconds or five seconds. And what that then means is that you now notice the difference. And uh, now this is me talking slowly, and now you can feel the difference. Like, they see you kind of paying a bit more attention. I saw your eyes drift though, so it's not quite working. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just trying to pay attention to this dog. Hopefully it doesn't <laughs> knock over any of the camera stuff. It'll be a great outtake though. Yeah, right. But I think rhythm, variety and rhythm is such an important tool for me in storytelling. One of my favorite examples is when uh, Logan was scammed three and a half million dollars of Pokemon cards. So I set up three and a half minutes of context of leading towards that moment of when he finds out that he got scammed. And so that entire shot was a minute and 45 seconds where I don't, when I didn't cut for a single moment. But what that then told me is that for me to earn me not needing to cut, I needed the first three and a half minutes to have a good, fast, aggressive pace. So therefore you then feel that difference. So much so that r genuinely right before that minute and a half uh, shot, I just, again, cut one second. No, even shorter, half a second, half a second, half a second break. And then you, in theory, are so engrossed, you don't even notice that I haven't cut for a minute and a half. And not cutting in a minute and a half for a YouTube video, that's unheard of. Like, you shouldn't do that, but that's how you can make that work. Now, talk about how you can incorporate that into, and if you can, into short form content. Because is this something, is this an editing trick or tip that you can bring into short form content and kind of just faster pace edits and then you kind of hang on something even longer. There's this one line in The Incredibles that I also live by and it's that thing of like, when everyone's super, no one is. And I kind of follow that same philosophy. When everything is fast, none of it is. Mm. And so actually, it, I would honestly say it could be in your interest to maybe try and break out of that. And so maybe you do start your video fast, like give them the the decent, here's what a video is, here's what I'm going to deliver to you, here is the promise, uh, and maybe you then bring into that. And then by that time, I think they are probably a bit more invested into the story. Uh, maybe in the fast 10, 20 seconds, maybe you can slow it down a little bit more. The entire thing doesn't have to be at that same pace. It's just these these differences in rhythm has to still be ingrained in storytelling context. So the context that you've given is still engaging enough, you can slow it down. And so I think that's that's really the most important thing is actually context. Wow. I thought you were gonna be like, where's my super suit? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you might Go fucking ahead. need it though when you're editing these vlogs in like a day, right? Like dailies, you would just be cutting them instantly. Like, yeah. was that a 10 hour day for you or yeah, did you get so fast at it that like, yeah, would someone cut? Would someone look at it with you, or was it just you in the UK? You wake up, boom, and you start going. During the two different periods, the first period it was 
uh, I would get sent the footage. I would spend like eight hours editing it, send it to Logan. He might give a couple notes, like fix, like trim this down just like another 20 seconds or something. And then I'd do that and then we would then publish. Uh, due to very obvious reasons, we then had a review pro process afterwards where the, where we did have lawyers and managers just going through it just in case something could be taken out of context or or something was controversial because when, when you're kind of in the thick of it and you're doing for these things every single day, your filter, your quality filter does dip. Mm. And so we needed the professionals to help us when we're also in the thick of it and, you, and we, don't, we don't quite know what we're seeing anymore. Uh, and I think so that was, uh, but so yeah, so after, so after, yeah, so as I said, very specific reasons that we then had people viewing it with a fresh perspective. But again, it was that meant it was like eight to 10 hour days every single day, just working incredibly fast. I've had friends who have watched me edit on coffee shops and they're like, it's like, there's been times when the computer just couldn't keep up with me. It's just like, I'm like, this decision, this decision. And like, it's just like, I'm compressing two hours of things into five minutes in a matter of hours. And people are like, well, what just happened? Uh, and and so I think it's now that I'm getting older, I'm a lot more intentional with my pace. I kind of swung the opposite direction where I would look at a cut and I'd be and I'd sit there and think, okay, so what is the next best choice to make rather than just throwing something there without much thought? Mm. And so I've gone in the opposite direction where I'm more, much more of an intentionally slower editor now. I mean, that's great. You, mm -hmm. You're actually able to sit with the footage and see if it's something that you know you want to cut to. You referenced earlier though about how Jimmy kind of brought you in mm -hmm. uh, to be almost this devil's advocate to the <laughs> things that you guys were making together. Uh, so how would the process go? So he had a team of people that were mm. already cutting it and you would come in later. Would you come in earlier in the process when they were sorting the clips and kind of help build the story out? Yeah. Cause now he has, you know, just such a massive team helping on all these different things. So yeah, I think the reason why I started working with Jimmy was this is when the retention editing era was like really uh, ramping up. And as for me going, this is awful. Like this, like nothing, like this is, I absolutely hate what's happening to editing nowadays. And so I then did a big speech at an event called Vid Summit, where I was like, hey guys, all the content you're making is shit. And let me tell you why. And then Jimmy went, well, fuck you then. Put your money where your mouth is. Here's a job. And so I then started working with Jimmy. And, and in the sense that where him, he had someone whose job was specifically to be in charge of retention editing. He would be the one who would be giving the editors, here's how to make this optimized. Here's how to make this as fast as possible. Here's how to make this efficient. Um, whereas for me, I'm like, well, this is taking out so much character. This is taking out so much personality. Uh, here's how to put that back in. And so basically Jimmy being the evil mastermind gave me a mortal enemy. And then it was like me and his job to be consistently every single day arguing on how the video should be edited. And then over time, we would then end up finding the middle ground. One of the best examples is one of the, uh, a contestant was isolated in a room for as many days as he can. And every single day an object is taken away from the room. And so, and it, the game was how long can he spend in this environment before he goes crazy? It's very dystopian, very squid game. <laughs> how long do you think you could last? Yeah, how long you could think you could last? No, in I'm asking no, you, how you, long? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> I'm an introvert, so that sounds like heaven. <laughs> so to be isolated in a room for at least 30 days, honestly, hell yeah, I'm gonna catch up on so much sleep, it will be amazing. You could Probably, do it, no problem. I think I could do it with no problem. Oh, dude, I've I, actually, I'm, I've always wanted that, if I'm honest. Dude, one, he, one day, if I'm in a hotel room for too long and I don't see people, I freak out. How many times do you? Hugging it. <laughs> you need at least three to stay sane, dude, in a hotel room. I love that joke. He's like, I get to the front desk. I'm way going out. Um, I will say, though, I love the idea of taking an object away, though, every day. It's like, yeah. and do they know, like, what object is being taken? Or is it like, wait, what the fuck is, like, going on in my brain? Like, is something going on that, it that was, would fuck with my head, right? I, I, I just know I got COVID, and I was in my room for, like, seven days, and I was going crazy yeah. at day, like, yeah, six yeah. or seven. Well, it's, for me, I'm just... I'm kind of just tired of life, and so taking a break from it would be nice. <laughs> but you're right. Sounds like you just need a vacation, bro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. I've been trying to launch this business for the past three years. I'm tired, guys. <laughs> Basically, what happened was that uh, over time, this person came to be thinking about his partner, his girlfriend, and he's like, I actually love this person, and I'm actually missing her so much. And he is getting tempted to leave the room just so he can see his girlfriend again. And then near the end of the video, he then asks Jimmy, hey, uh, use some of my prize money and buy a ring so I can propose to her at the end of this video. And for me, 
I that's the story. Through isolation, he learns how much he loves his girlfriend and wants to spend the rest of his life and he wants to spend the rest of his life with her. Amazing. That's crazy. They wanted to cut all of that out. Mm. Oh wow. Mm. And their logic is this, and I understand this logic. Whenever someone maybe starts talking about their partner or their mother's in hospital or uh, or ex or like like hey like hey I'm having some financial hard times I lost my job it's kind of the sad story or the character development as the, to their motivation they would get a ten percent drop off or 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 sometimes more like people would stop watching the moment someone starts uh, telling uh, their their life story in a way. And so that taught them to not do it uh, because in their, at that scale, if you're getting 50 to 60 to 100 million views, if 10% drop off, that's 10 million people who stopped watching. And in their logic, that's 10 million people who will not see that next ad. And so that is incredibly valuable for them to be able to make sure that everyone stays. Uh, so, but then it was my mission to keep it to then, so therefore, and my logic was is that at that time, they just told those sad story. they just told those character developments just really badly. They just got like some crappy stock piano music and put it underneath and they turn everything black and white in slow motion. And it's like, it's just cheesy. It was just poorly made storytelling. And so I showed them how they can give character development in a mature way. And then that, and then it worked. That video then became kind of one of the most celebrated and talked about videos at that time. It was like, oh my God, like I cared the fact that this person proposed at the end, but I had to fight to get it mm -hmm. to that point. Uh, then, but then honestly, at that point though, uh, I went, this is fun. This is a really good experience, but I want to refocus on something else. And so I chose to leave. I kind of went like, ah, my job here's done. But then a year or so later, Jimmy then calls me back and then says, hey, I actually kind of miss working with you. I filmed a video where we cured a thousand people's blindness. Do you want to be an editor on that one? So similar thing, Jimmy had learned, I would say the value of storytelling and character development. And then he then asked me, hey, I want you to put more effort into that, into uh, the blind video. And so same thing, he just hands me a hard drive, gives me some really talented assistant editors. And I went, all right, let's fucking go. Let's hit, instead of me being an edit producer, oh, there we go, I found a segue. Here, so instead of me being a, a story producer where I'm directing the editors, let me see if I can really massage it and do it myself. And that video was, incredibly, was an incredible challenge of, again, the spectacle of doing medical miracles on top of the, mo the emotional motivations of these people's experiences and making sure that it's not cheesy and presented maturely. And so I did everything I can to present it in the most mature way possible, where essentially, instead of it being a YouTube video, it kind of ended up being like a documentary. And that presentation was really, really great. And then, however, though, I do feel like, ne I, do feel like I went a bit too far from the Mr. Beast brand. And so when I then showed it to Jimmy, Jimmy was like, uh, this is not going to work on my channel. And so we then had to completely sort of revamp about 50% of the video back into the YouTube language. And, uh, and, but, and so in, at the time, it hurt to watch. Uh, seeing seeing essentially almost 50% of the entire video that you made. I said like my vision, my my original version was around 13 minutes. Theirs was about maybe six or seven, maybe, maybe a little bit less if I remember correctly. Us as filmmakers, we want our audiences watching it and we assume that they are as emotionally available as we would like them to be in watching our content. But because it's on YouTube where Someone's waiting for their bus. Someone's waiting for their meal to be cooked in the microwave. Uh, someone's watching it while they're having a shit on the toilet. Asking them for something solely, asking them to be so emotionally available for quite a deep emotional story, they're just gonna stop watching. Like, no, I don't, I'm not in the mood for this and they'll stop watching. And so we had to pull back how emotionally deep that video was and kind of make it a lot more digestible, but still keep it emotional enough that they know that this is a refreshing experience. So for the retention guy that is going, that you're working with at that mm. time, right? Does that guy sit down and he just has a notebook and he's like, that's that gotta go, that's gotta go, that's got, that can stay, that's gotta go. He says, yeah. bored. Yeah, <laughs> what, yeah what, how does it work? <laughs> Next. Because <laughs> their, their style has changed so much. Even in the last two to three months, he's slowed down dramatically. He's mm -hmm. adding way more character development. I The last one that I watched was the one that Dan Mace did where they went to, I believe,
believe it was like Chile or something, and they mm. built the hospital. Uh, I, I don't remember quite the country. Or it was Peru. It was yeah. Peru, and they made the hospital. But the stuff has gotten so much slower, even on the main channel, where mm. I watched the one the other day where the guys like went in a Ferrari and they had to do all those little challenges. But they're so much slower, mm -hmm. way more involved. You feel like you really know at least one or two, maybe even three sometimes of those characters that they're yeah. adding in. It's not so fast. Well, it's because they're telling it maturely now. I would like to think part that's one of the impacts that I left there. It's they're actually telling it maturely. They're not putting shitty stock music and making it slow motion. Is that they're actually lit they're actually casting these contestants well now, where they can be compelling enough in sharing their story. Uh, they are motivating it a lot more into the perspective of that person. And so we feel and so we feel like they have earned that win rather than the fact they just win. It's just they weren't doing it well before. Now they can do it well. And so therefore they are getting the results that they've been needed because I think character development is such a hard thing. And then also at that time, not many people really, really consider this. When Mr. Beast was coming up and blowing up and it was just high spectacle, really fast paced videos where so much happens, but yet nothing happens. That was during the pandemic. Uh, where we're all very exhausted, emotionally exhausted, pol po political tensions were really high at that time. W all of us are struggling. And so when we see someone else struggling, we're like, oh, fuck you, I have a hard life too. And so actually the world wasn't really emotionally available at that time. But now where we are today in the culture of today, we're a lot more wanting and needing connections post pandemic because actually we, are want we, we missed connecting with people. And so I think just the world's appetite for content changed. And now, and I think Jimmy has identified that. And now, now that him and his team have matured enough to be able to tell it not poorly, it's what, that's why it's now working. It was just at the time, no one wanted it, but now people do. It's crazy to just see the, the change in their content and all across YouTube, all across, mm. I feel like even the short form stuff is a whole lot. Cause I remember, Maybe it was during the pandemic, but his shorts were going every single one. It was like the fastest growing channel were the shorts mm. and the words on the screen. It was every singular word. Oh, yeah, uh, it was brutal, dude. It was like retention editing was like it was crazy. I think one of the worst things to ever happen in mm. web media history. Wow. And, I, and I think it was just I think here's what happened with all of that is that uh, we would the thing is like it's flashing images. It's so much is happening that our brain is trying to process what's happening. But before we finally concluded what we just saw, we've already moved on. Mm. And so actually we genuinely were put into a hypnotic trance, wow. but then like scientifically, like put into a hypnotic trance. But then when that video ends, I bet you, we all subconsciously went, I don't really know what happened. <laughs> nothing, nothing happened. Uh, and then you move on and you forget that you watched it. You just know that you did, but you actually don't know what you saw. And I think over time, We've all subconsciously come to realize that when that type of content that's over edited, which I also call insecure editing, it's because you know that your content has absolutely nothing. Nothing is actually said, nothing's profound, nothing's deep, nothing gives actual change. It's just a bunch of visual noise. You may as well just watch flashing colors where nothing really does happen. And we have come to learn how unsatisfying that is. And so I think er everyone's been pulled back on it because we now realize it's nothing content. There's nothing burgers. Yeah, people I feel like are craving that uh, just to sit down and actually enjoy something and connect mm. with, like you're saying, connect with someone and hear their story. And mm. I think it, I see it changing a ton right now on YouTube. It's very yeah. interesting. We all enjoy McDonald's every now and again. But if we started having it every single day, we're going to get sick of it. It's like we get we see the Big Mac for like the seventh day in a row, and it's like, oh, not again. me. Mm. <laughs> I'm three months strong, baby. Every <laughs> single day, <laughs> nuggets, baby. Come on. Okay, maybe the chicken nuggets. No, no, I'll yeah. tolerate. Yeah, dude, their chicken nuggets slap. <laughs> they are. No, but you're you're so right. That's that's a really good point. Like, you're gonna get um, fatigued yeah. if you if you consume too much. I guess of the same concept of the same content or eat too much. Of the it's same exhausting. Food. Yeah, yeah, it's exhausting. It's uh, another way of phrasing it. Uh, there's an episode of Community that makes fun of the concept, but it is a genuinely really good visual example where you have Donald Glover's character and he buys a giant cookie at the start of the episode, like a huge cookie. And that's his entire thing. 
uh, throughout the episode, you do, you, you just cut, they just cut to him eating more and more of the cookie. And at the end of the episode, halfway, he's only finished half of the cookie. And it looks like, I don't think I can have any of this anymore. Oh, it's because you can't have too much of a good thing. <laughs> like it was like really like meta sort of upfront about the point. But I feel like so many people need to watch that episode to understand that concept. So yeah, like you, like a, a giant cookie is great, but I bet you can only be able to get through half of it. <laughs> you also funny. bring up a really good point of like emotional availability. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it is the same or a similar concept to watching a movie on your mm. laptop or yeah. on your iPad, like in bed versus going to the theater. Right. Like, yes. When I go to the theater and watch a movie, I'm so much more into it. And mm. I'm like, I'm not gonna check my phone. Like, right. it's obviously just a better viewing experience. I have a really hard time sitting through a full movie on my laptop in bed without checking my phone or being distracted. It's, I believe it's because of the transaction that we mm. make in that choice. When we're watching something on our phone, we've been trained it's quite a passive thing. On our laptops, we have all of our emails, we have all of our messages, we have everything else that we can do on our laptop. And the back of our mind, we know that, that we can be doing so much more. And so we feel tempted to maybe just check Twitter while this scene's not that interesting. Or when you're watching things on TV, you have a bit more of an intent. But then when you go to the theater, what happens? It is, you, you see all the marketing for that movie. So you go, oh, that looks fun. So you go online, you buy the ticket, then you drive to the cinema. And, and then you're thinking about the movie, you're, you're, you're anticipating the movie. And then you probably buy a shitty hot dog. And then you watch 30 minutes of ads but, or trailers before the movie actually begins. And now the movie begins. And that entire transaction, because of the effort that we've put in, makes us that's the emo that's the transaction that we need to have to then become emotionally available and now we're in and then if the movie's not great we still watch the whole movie in the, in the cinema but if the movie's not great on our phone what do we do we stop watching because the yeah. transaction was so much smaller i mean if the first 10 15 seconds are right. good i'm, I'm on to yeah, the next. You Dude, i'm not above walking out of a movie i've done it four <laughs> yeah, times you, this year yeah you do be four doing times that. yeah this four year? times shit movies dude i'm out i'm I out only, once a month no, i only did it. that haunting in venice i mm. lane and i sit down we watch it i'm like god i'm kind of struggling i see she's sleeping i sleep we wake up end of the movie i'm like nice <laughs> I've never done it before in my life, dude. Usually I'm very fucking on it, but yeah, that locked in. sucked. If, if I'm lost, I'm out, dude. Yeah. I'm out of there. I love the Dane Cook bit about how when we watch trailers before a movie, you become a movie critic after. Oh, yeah. Then eating popcorn, <laughs> like, looks pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I'm definitely going to go see that, that moment in between. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I do yeah, do yeah. that, actually. Yeah, it really does. I think the only movie I've ever walked out of was Expendables 3. Mm. Uh, again, because I think... I, I, I watched it and it had a really, really underwhelming action sequence that kind of sucked. And then they're doing like, they're leading up to like the really cool title sequence, Expendables 3, this is gonna be the best fucking thing ever. <laughs> but what they do is that Sylvester Stallone does like the slow motion walking away shot. He presses the button and a helicopter blows up behind him. And it was like the worst CGI I had ever seen. It was just like, like, like a like the stock helicopter explosion that you probably download off YouTube, you know, mm. with the shitty green screen background. And I'm like, oh, this is what the whole, whole movie is going to be like? No, I cannot do this. It's the only movie I've walked out on. Dude, I would also say, you know it's a good movie when you leave the theater and you just like can't quite adapt into the regular world again. Yeah. You just feel like that. Like I remember when I saw, like I saw <laughs> Talk To Me and I was just yep. like looking around like, holy shit, like I'm in the real world. This doesn't feel like you're so locked. I'm like, I don't know if I blinked once through that whole movie. And like there's a few movies like that where I just like can't assimilate back into the real world for like an hour. Equalizer mm -hmm. when he like flips the gun on him, I'm oh, walking oh, out. I'm yeah. like, if someone steps <laughs> on me, dude, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna flip it back. I'm, flip it back on you, dude. I'm like, I'm in 7 Eleven, I'm like, someone rob me. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm just ready, dude. Flip it back. Yes, dude. Yeah. <laughs> that I, meme is so funny. I just had that with uh, Civil War. No, I yeah, saw it IMAX, Dolby uh -huh. Dolby sound system, it was phenomenal. And I was like, I got in the car and I just drove back in silence. It was Love just like that. such an intense feeling. But that's that's the true value, that part where it's like how long it stays with you. Yeah. And and I think that's where the true value of the content or film or TV show that you're making. And so and, and so that's but part of it comes with the transaction that we have to give towards the film and TV. And then the transaction they give back is the lasting memory afterwards. And so how long that thing stays with you. And so when we're watching these shorts, it doesn't stay with you because we're immediately watching the next one. It doesn't stay. The only transaction we really have is like, oh, that was funny. Let me share it with my girlfriend. And then maybe that's a transaction. Like that's it. It's just, it is the before and after 
in anything that we're making is actually the most important part. Mm. Right? Like, let's look at the, like the long tail of like Dune 2. I feel like people are still thumping and talking about it, dude. You know? Did you see that movie, Dune? Too light. Oh, Dune. The Dune second two. one? I need to see the second Dune one. Second one, yeah. Oh, you haven't seen it? All right. My only thought, I liked it. Timothy Chalamet's character, too many names, dude. <laughs> he's got like five names. Paul Atreides. He's Paul Atreides. He's Usul. He's Madalib. He's Lisa Nalib. What's the yeah. little he's what's too the, many? Dude. No, what's the he's little mouse? The, baby mouse. That's Madalib or whatever. Oh. Madalib. Five names, dude. It's one too many. It's actually three too many. Pick one, dude. <laughs> Pick one, dude. Okay, I have one more question about Mr. Beast uh, before we move on. Mr. Beast is Jimmy, by the way. Jimmy. My, yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you were working with him, right, and you learned some things from their team, and what are a few either YouTube specific editing techniques that you see now that you're like man that was one that I, I still continue to put in my videos because there's one that I, I did learn from you a while back where you said that when you're cutting on someone's eye level on mm -hmm. YouTube and you zoom in a lot of people move the eye level down a little bit and it's very jarring kind of yeah. distracting so you put that vertical or horizontal line and yeah. so you're always cutting in and their eye level staying the same that was a very helpful tip is there mm -hmm. one that you could maybe share with, with the audience that you're like man this is one that I continue to see that people mess up or need to do in their edits. Well, you're right. I think eye line is a really, really important one for me because we are cutting so fast. We have to make sure that it is not jarring. And so every time I do do jump cuts in anything, I'm always conscious of eye line. But because uh, it, it is like we don't because we don't really have enough time to be scanning to where the next main focal point that we want them to focus on. So we've got to make it as easy for them to find in the next cut. Uh, but then I think the thing that I probably learned from Jimmy or of that Mr. Beast camp, honestly... I think I rejected a lot of their lessons because I just fundamentally disagreed with them. Um, but I think I, I, I would like to think I gave them a lot of lessons in terms of maturity. Uh, I think like allowing them to have character development, allowing them to have setting up and payoffs. Like uh, one, of the best, one of the best examples is with the Squid Game video that he did. The person who won was like the first time we ever saw that person. And so one of the feedbacks that I gave to Jimmy is that if that person wins, you have to make them have consistent screen time across the entire video. And so it feels like that they've earned that win. They now do that now. Uh, but that, that, I didn't invent that. That's a classic reality TV editing storytelling concept. But I have to be very arrogant and admit, I think I didn't really learn anything myself from the Mr. Beast camp because I thought a lot of their philosophies were the exact opposite of what I consider good content. But I will say what they are doing now is what I've wanted them to be doing. And I actually now really enjoy what they're making now. Wow, so interesting. It's, you, it's crazy. Do you find before it was hard for you to sit through a Mr. Mm. Beast video? Uh, <laughs> I would prefer to have been grinding my and sanding my teeth. That's funny. I just couldn't, yeah. <laughs> you, you brought up the um, person stuck in a room mm -hmm. and you found that underlying storyline. You also broke down the Arak video mm -hmm. where people think that the story is about him trying to find, or his his sister trying to find a boyfriend. Yeah. But the underlying story is that he's an overprotective brother. Yes. How important is that underlying story that maybe isn't as obvious at the start? How important is that to a good story? Well, I think we have the A plot, which is the thing that's always, always explicitly said, but then the B plot is, yeah, is the underlying uh, actual story it's uh it's a writing so it's a writing concept from it's 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 a bit of a the book's made fun of but i still treat it with a good respect called save the cat which is about want and it says characters always should have and have a want a need and a flaw and so they want this but they need this but they actually need this and they're not aware of it but the flaw is they have a behavioral issue that stops them from getting their need and their want. And then the real story is overcoming the flaw to then achieve what they need. And so in in so in Eric's video, he did that perfectly. The want is, the want of the video is for his sister to uh, find a boyfriend. But the flaw is that Eric is being an overprotective brother and only choosing the boyfriend that she, that she, that he thinks she deserves, and so the need is to let go of the overprotectiveness and allow her to make her own decisions, and so that's a really great story. And so, and the need and the flaw should never be explicitly set. It should always be implied. It should always be suggested because the moment it is explicitly said, it becomes a want, and so that's the actual story. And we don't normally say it out loud, but we do internally feel that 
change when we see someone be a bad person, such as being an overprotective brother, and then learning to let her go. Like it's that's nice. We that is a change, and I think that's the most important thing. And so I'm always very conscious of that. And so if you're not really developing in your video that type of narrative. It's just not as satisfying as it could be. With the content that you're making now, you're, right, mm -hmm. you're, you're working on maybe a documentary for two or three months, mm -hmm. back to the YouTube videos you were doing with Mr. Beast or with Logan Paul. How has the process changed from you physically sitting down to edit? What is that like now? Do you Is this mm -hmm. the same sorting process? Do you have more time to spend? Do you have assistant editors that you get to mm -hmm. work with? You even mentioned before the pod how you have five people that are contracted under you. So what is it like now we're now having your own team and you're not just waking up and grinding on it yourself? I think what it is now is you're right, I think me approaching 30 I'm not having that same energy as I used to have now and so I can't really be in the thick of it as much as I'd like to be anymore so but then all and so what it means is that uh, I am going into these projects finding that direction in mind and then fusing this and help direct the younger people who have that energy uh, and so I was like hey going into this podcast, these are these are the really interesting topics. And so if you can focus on this, you can give them this type of experience, make sure you are cutting to this type of thing, give it this type of a uh, ping pong experience. And uh, and and then they send me and they send me that version back and then I'll probably just do a screen recording and just give roast to their entire edit, send it back to them, or I'll spend an entire day giving them 200 notes on Frame.io and sending that back to them. And so giving them the experience and them sort of also them allowing them to figure it out. And so in a lot of cases uh, in my business, I'm not as much in the thick of it of the editing. I'm letting other people doing it and then they are benefiting from the experiences I had and me sharing it to them. But in this is a documentary, I still prefer to be in the thick of it in that sense, because it is, if I've gotten, if I've gotten the overall idea of the story, okay, so this character in this documentary had this arc. So this is the type of footage that I need to be looking for. And I've come to an understand uh, reading body languages, meaning reading eye movements, uh, being aware of like uh, of like vocal, vocal volume and how I can help tell that story. So I'm actively looking for that stuff that I've learned that younger editors don't quite have that empathy to find yet. And so, in a lot of cases, I still have to go through everything looking for those moments. So therefore I can then build upon it myself. Otherwise, because yeah, there has been times when I have an assistant editor go through it. They give me the selects and I go, but I'm looking for something like this. And I go into, and I go into the, the actual footage and I can find immediately what I'm, what I'm looking for in a minute. And I'm like, why didn't you give me this in the assembly? And so I think I'm, what it is, what has changed is with, Logan and it, or maybe also a little bit of a Jimmy, I was getting the footage and I was being reactive. What, what was I getting? And then using that to tell me how to edit. And so what that meant was that the footage was actually in charge. As I have been growing and maturing, I've been finding the intent of what I want the video to be. And now I'm in charge. I now have, I now get to tell the footage what I want it to be rather than it telling me what it is. It's so interesting to see kind of how you've just grown over these last few years of your career. That reminds me of something you told me. You've told us actually, the, your first agency job, mm -hmm. you like really learned how to pull selects yeah. from like the senior editor. Yeah, as much as like a creative director, he'd be mm -hmm. like, oh, why didn't you like pull this like weird, like blurry, like not even blurry, but like clip that I just would have never thought to use. And mm -hmm. it just like, I remember walking home every day from that job being like, like just like I felt like my world is just like, you know what I mean? Like expanding because it was just like, oh, like that actually does make sense. And that is like an important part of a video that I had never thought to include. You know what I mean? Like mm. even something that adds like a little bit humanity that's not like actually really perfect. It mm -hmm. like maybe it looks cleaner or like less clean and that actually adds something. Yeah. I think that's pretty cool to like just see and be like, where is this? Do we have that? You yeah. Know? A specific example is this where there was a video I just finished uh, with Michelle Carre. And what it was, it was just five people sitting at a table and essentially having a conversation for an hour, but there's raising stakes. But essentially, the best way of putting it, there's a there's a bomb under the table. And so we feel that tension of like, okay, these people are kind of talking about anything and we're feeling that tension. But while the emotional stakes in that conversation is getting higher. And so for me, it is 
one of the passes that I did, and I learned this from uh, one of the editors from Chernobyl. He edited each of the scenes from that character's perspective. And so he could get more micro movements and more reactions because he specifically focused on that person. And then when he had like the four people's perspectives of that scene, he wouldn't choose the best bits of all of them. And therefore we got perspectives of a shared perspective of what the X stakes means to them. I did a similar thing where me at me and one, and one, of, the, one of the editors I was working with did a pass where we picked every single micro movement from each of those people's uh, experience. And so if someone looked down like this, mark it. We, we put it, we put it in a different, we put it in a different sequence. If the other person looked at that person quite dramatically, put it in, put it in their own sequence. Uh, Michelle looked at this person and then looked to the right, a bit more panicked. Great, let's put that in, in her own sequence. And then what that then meant is I had a collection of reactions. And then that then meant and then even with that, I might have three different versions where one of the talent went down, maybe another one down a bit more or less, and then the other one, it just maybe just moved down with their eyes. I would experiment with all three of those reactions and then go, oh, actually the smallest movement told me the most in the story. And then putting that in gave us the more uh, impactful reactions. And I think just that whole process wouldn't have been something if I was a reactive editor. Mm, yeah, and right. if you're just getting it and having to figure it out on the fly and mm -hmm. change it as you go. You you also have your own podcast, which is mm -hmm. you're the first guest we've ever had on that has their own show. Uh, what, what has that been like having a podcast? Is it something that you recommend to the people? Do you hate having a podcast? <laughs> so I, I assume you guys severely underestimated how tough running a podcast is as well. <laughs> yep. It's like, yeah, oh, yeah, we'll just, we'll just bring mates over. We'll hang yeah. out. It's fine. Oh, we have to edit it? Fuck. You know, and then, and then, and then also the thing that I've also come to learn is that we were probably recording for two hours, but then we realize we're not as interesting as we think we are. And so now we have to cut it down to maybe 30 minutes. I wanted to start a podcast because one thing that I realized was that it's really great for me to be nerding out about editing and storytelling on my channel. But I know there's so many other people who also want to do the same that probably don't really have a channel or, or, or probably don't even realize how talented they are in editing, let's celebrate that. And so I started the editing podcast for them to celebrate other editors and other storytellers and for me to also learn because I got to admit, I had doing editing education on my channel and I kind of ran out of knowledge. I ran out and I was like, I, I don't know what to make videos on anymore. And so admittedly, I then started the channel so I could then start learning again myself. Uh, uh, essentially, my new plan then became, became bringing in a new mentor every week, letting them teach me something, letting them teach me something that that's going to fundamentally reshape everything I know about creativity and editing. But running a podcast is something that I severely underestimated. And then especially with the style that I'm wanting, where again, the strategy of how can I get a two hour conversation done in 30 minutes and you don't feel those cuts. That is a whole art form in itself that I am still really struggling with. What's well, been one of the things that you've learned from these mentors that you've had on the show? Because I, I feel like in, in our situation, it's similar where we get people that sit in your seat and we learn tons about the ways that they're running their business or mm. the ways that they're filming their content or like you editing your stuff from these pro editors that you've had me from Chernobyl or mm. from the other movies. I mean, you had David Fincher yeah, on. David, David Fincher's, Fincher's editing. Nuts. Yeah, yeah. David editor. Fincher's editor. Ridiculous. That was fun. What'd you, I, yeah, what'd you learn from David Fincher's editor? I think two of my favorite things from him is one, he as an editor is very conscious of when people are blinking. And, and it's something that also came from another editor called Walter Murch, who kind of pioneered that concept. And basically the theory is, is that when an actor blinks, that's the actor, not the character. And so it actually breaks the illusion. And so what uh, he does is he chooses takes specifically where an actor is not blinking, or he, or he chooses a moment when if he's cutting to a reaction, their blink is at a specific line. So let's just say, X character says something dramatic, he'll come back to the person, blink. And it's like, that's like, that's them trying to process the information. So he's even being conscious of when to time a blink. <laughs> and if there's a take that someone has, that's really good. And this is from another editor that taught me this one, uh, the who edited Andor, who also edited Chernobyl as well. What he also does is that if someone blinks, 
and it, and he also feels like it breaks the illusion. He motion tracks a still of those person's eyes <laughs> of the frame just before, and motion tracks it on so he completely hides the blink. <laughs> And so what it means is I'm, uh, you're all blinking now and I'm really conscious. It's really funny now. And so what it means is that eye contact is so much more intense because the blinking is not breaking anything. And after the back of our minds, I feel this, when we notice someone's not blinking, that increases that intensity. And so that is how detailed TV and film editors get. We think, us on web media, we think we detailed. Man, the shit that they talk about is on another level. But... One of my favorite ones is with David Fincher was the, uh, with vertical editing that he described, where I initially was calling it contrast editing, you know, where one shot's quiet and then the next shot's really loud. Uh, he called it vertical editing and he was, and he was breaking it down if, with the last film he edited with David Fincher with The Killer and how that vertical editing of when we're seeing Michael Fassbender building a gun and he's wearing headphones. And then when we cut back to his POV, we're then hearing the Smiths really, really loudly. We cut back out and it's like super quiet. And it just, and he was using that to help build this really tense anticipation to when he's getting prepared to fire. And he was using the sound editing to help build that attention and that anticipation. And that is something that I came very conscious of. And then I then implemented that in the last Michelle Carre video where the video generally opens with vertical editing. And it's so powerful. And that's why I'm doing the podcast. I don't know anything about editing. These people do. Let them teach me something so then I can then be a better editor myself. I was editing this thing with uh, CJ Stroud and the client was like, he's clearly reading off the teleprompter and like not looking at the screen. And I saw he Googled, this was, well, I'm not gonna tell you when. Tell us. <laughs> this is recently. I Googled, AI eye tracker and yes. you can just make his eye look at the screen. It was, it's sick. You just plop and paste it. And it works really well. Yeah. yeah. I used it in, um, I think Descript has it one built in mm -hmm. and then I used it in it. There was another one that was an After Effects plugin. It also worked pretty well. I'm not going to blink anymore. <laughs> the other thing I was thinking about the blinking, I wonder if Jason Bateman has to be like, can you put my blinks back in? Because you know, he's just always doing the fucking slow blink, like in reaction to things. <laughs> that's funny. I feel like that's his whole thing. You but know? Actors even like the, the most advanced actors do time oh, their I'm blinks sure, yeah. in the dialogue because they are aware of it, but they're not as experienced actors. They have to fix that lot. I remember taking a, a, an acting class in college and one of the questions that like the class asked was like about blinking and the teacher was like you just have to make the choice not to blink and I'm like <laughs> buddy right. like, <laughs> I'm blinking right. like but you know that's why maybe I'm not an actor so one of the actors that's insane at it is Robert Downey Jr. yeah Oh my God, there's one video on YouTube specifically of like a BTS of him recording an Iron Man scene and it's probably like a minute, 30, two minutes and just doesn't blink. I'm like, how do you do that? <laughs> it's so crazy that's just blinking because you don't notice it. You'd think it would be weird if they're just staring all the time. But yeah, I my girlfriend said that once at a bar, this guy came up to her and said like, you know, you can never be an actor, you blink too much and it's fucked, <laughs> dude, it fucked her whole brain. Up. And I was like, Lana, you know that guy was hitting on you, right? Like that, that's like how we do it. Classic, 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 classic line. Classic maneuver. Yeah. Yeah. But, <laughs> so you want to get out of here? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'll buy you a drink. I'll give okay. you a reason to blink. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah. That's but funny. It, too. You're right. It's like a. It's kind of like a trade secret in a way. Like right. the actors know about mm. it. The TV and film editors, like they're aware of it. But now you're not gonna be able to unsee it. And I think God. it's. And, and, and now when you're watching actors who are not as experienced and they're blinking randomly, it's like, you're not going with the rhythm of the flow of the edit now, or even with editors. Yeah, like, but you're right. If if actors are not great at it, the yeah. best thing is us editors can help fix your performance. Yeah, right. You know, but it's, I think with your technology that you mentioned, where it's like, you can fix someone's eye line. I know that, that streamers do that now, oh. but they don't tell their audience that they're doing it. And so what it means is that, they could be playing a video game, but they're actually looking at the chat, but the AI tool is happening live. That's crazy. That it looks like they're still playing the video game. And so they can be interacting with the chat or looking and moving around. So like, it, sometimes it slips. You will, you'll, they hit the move and the eyes would like just drift, mm. just like one frame. <laughs> but yeah, like streamers use that technology now because, uh, or, or what it means actually, or if they're talking to chat, they're looking down here, but the eye thing is making it look directly at the camera. So they're talking directly to the chat. It's like really scary Wild. technology, but it's so much more engaging because now it feels like 
I hate it when streamers are looking down and we can't yeah. see eye contact. So keeping it is so in fact is so effective. Should we do it with the podcast where yeah. we're just like we're constantly just, locked, just like looking just locked yeah. by the <laughs> camera? People are like, what the hell is going on? Has there been something we had we had a uh, Machine Gun Kelly's filmmaker on Sam K Hill mm-hmm. a minute ago, and he was talking about how uh, he was editing their documentary, and mm-hmm. a dog came in the house and mm-hmm. yanked the drive from oh, the no. wall, <laughs> and it tangled it all up and just corrupted everything. Everything was gone. Has there been a moment in your career that you've had just a horror story that you might be able to share with us that you might not have been able to pull out of your ass that just got mm. ruined there's definitely a few but i feel like they were so traumatic i've put them in a <laughs> closet to never open ever again so i'm trying to open i'm trying i'm going into my mind trying to open up that we'll drawer open up pandora's box right, mm, here we go. i think one that i'll probably uh it, it is one with uh logan paul specifically he filmed a music video and I just came to the house at the end, at nearing the end of the day and I still filming a music video. I said, hey, Hayden, you got a spare, spare pair of hands? Here's a camera, you go start filming. And so for me, instinctively, I have the habit, okay, new shoot, what do you do? You format the SD card. Oh, <laughs> no. And so, and they had spent the entire day filming. I don't think, oh, I've never told no. him this. So if he watches this, I'm screwed. So the entire day of filming that they had on one of those cameras, which was one of the main cameras, <laughs> was gone. Oh my. God. And Wait, did you realize it on the shoot? I didn't like, realize it until uh, until later on. I'm like, hey, Logan, I'm missing some camera footage uh, of like this angle, but I'm seeing someone else filming. Like, where is this? And I went, I don't know. And they then had to spend an entire day chasing that person. And they and and I felt so guilty. No, I felt so under pressure that I made them all blame that person. Nice. They made the, like so he deleted the footage, but I actually deleted the footage. So I ruined this guy's entire career because I didn't want to get in trouble. Oh no, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> He's Dude, homeless now. That, out of a job. that feeling when you're on the shoot and you realize you fucked up yeah. and you're just like hot and you're just looking around like, yeah. oh my god, do they know? Like, uh, how am I going to tell them? That well, is, is everybody worst, looking at me. That is the worst feeling. It's like a weird chemical. Like it starts in your yep. head and it kind of like your shoulders mm-hmm. burn yeah. Yeah. suddenly. God. And then like that, like it's like a burn chill, and your it just goes down your entire yeah. body, and you're like, oh, I'm fucked. Yeah, that's so funny. There's, there's also been a few times, but I'm I'm probably invite I'm probably inviting more of it, but all of all of Logan's archive is still on a cloud drive, and a couple of people have tried to hack into it, oh. and uh, and there was one time last year where I got a text from Mike Malak, who's uh, one, who's one of Logan's best friends. It's like, hey, Hayden, how you doing? We haven't spoken for a while. Uh, and, and we had like a quick catch up chat. It's like, hey, uh, by the way, Logan needs me to get a file uh, from, from this. Can you share me the folder? And I went, yeah, sure. So I didn't, so I was like, went into the drive, hit share. I was about to give him the link and I went, wait a minute. Hey, Mike, tell me about that time we did that X thing at X location. And he went, what do you mean? Well, yeah, tell me about that memory. I don't know what you're talking about. And I realized that I was getting catfished. Uh, Someone was what? pretending to be Mike to try to get access to our entire cloud drive. And if they got access to that entire cloud drive, they then had access to Logan's entire archive. We've now taken it all offline now and it's wow. now on a physical drive just because of that instance. But it was so close to giving someone else email or text. It was on text. And did you verify with Mike that it wasn't him? Like- it was. It was. But what it was, it was Mike Malak at iCloud.com. Oh. Oh. And Mike's actual uh, Apple account is is his actual email. And so it just it was like one letter Jeez, off. Dude. Like the Mike Malak was a one rather than an rather than an I. Wow. And so it was so close. And I had a brand new iPhone as well, so the message history mm-hmm. wasn't there. So I genuinely, for a very brief moment, thought it was Mike. That was the closest we got Fuck, that's to, to it. And so uh, if that guy's watching, you almost got me. You almost, <laughs> he's almost shit, got buddy. me. He's shit. <laughs> okay, going back to your podcast real quick, because I do want to get a little bit more into it. You edit your podcast differently than like a normal podcast because you show examples mm. of the actual videos and movies that these people are talking about. Do you have them provide you with those assets? Because the way you do it is like you're able to show a scene Mm. without the music and then you show it with the music and how that makes a difference. So do you have those assets or how exactly do you edit the podcast like that? So I think it's one of the big rules for us where, of course, we 
it's a bit more of a tougher thing because we have to get in contact with the PR companies and the licensing rights to the distribution as well. And so like if we're having to show these scenes, we have to get permission from Universal. We have to get permission from May 24 so therefore they don't take the video down. And so our rule is if we can't get clips, we don't interview the person. I've completely revamped or rethinking how podcasts are presented where I've, I like to describe it as a podcast video essay where we show them like five seconds from that clip and we ask them, hey, tell us what you did here. And they'll probably then talk about those, that five seconds of choices over the course of two, three minutes. And then in the editing, we just show the actual clip and essentially kind of created like a DVD commentary in a way of them breaking down that sequence. And so, yeah, what it means is that it's, we get to actively see the choices that they make by the questions that we're asking them. And then we get into this really high, deeper details of them breaking down those scenes. And we just simply do it by priming them. We just show them five seconds and we ask them, what decisions did you make here? And then we just use all of that for them to then essentially break down their scene or their, those cuts and their choices. I've been listening to a lot of podcasts that do talk about editing. And I was like, yeah, so I had this problem. And so we did this and then we fixed it that way. And I'm like, well, I didn't know how you fix that problem. I want you to show me. And so part of it is us asking permission to get the scene without music, get the scene with just dialogue or even get the scene with just sound effects. I've now got a great sound effects library, but um, <laughs> but it's it's we ask specifically for that permission. And so they themselves can talk it through. So it, it makes it so much more interesting. When I was watching your show, you just feel really engaged with the things that you know you're putting out now. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. You also have you've transitioned a lot of your business as well. You came out this last, I believe, last year with a with an editing course. Yes. So tell me about the decision to to build an editing course because we you know we have digital products as mm -hmm. well, and it was one of those things where once I made a digital product that was successful. It made it so I didn't have to take work from brands mm. or clients that I didn't want to work with or that maybe I didn't have the best experience with in the past. And it, it really opened my mind to what's possible because you could wake up and have a digital product sell while you're mm -hmm. asleep. And then you're like, wow, I didn't work for 10 hours today. Yeah. That was kind of crazy to have this that, that realization. So mm. how, how has it been for you? What's been the feedback from it? For me, that's the benefit, but never the intent as to why mm. I made the course. But I do agree. It's now giving me the luxury that I get mm. to choose what projects to go on rather than feeling obligated to, to do one. But I think the reason why I wanted to start the course was that there's some advanced editing concepts that are actually really hard to package on, on YouTube. It's like, you know, like I have to package a lot of my YouTube videos, like this one editing trick, make sure you know this one, otherwise you're gonna fall behind. I'm like, I fucking hate that stuff. And so I actually wanted to collect the really fantastic advanced editing and storytelling concepts that I know that are actually hard to package, but I'm putting it in a library that people can then digest where I don't have to do edutainment. Like I can actually give them straight up practical education on how to be doing these editing and storytelling concepts. And so I didn't have to write jokes. I didn't have to, uh, skim over things. I was able to spend some decent time mm -hmm. really diving deep into that concept for that audience that wanted to have that education. The benefit of that is because if I was to put those videos on YouTube and it, let's just say 100,000 people watch it, but only really 1,000 people would actually benefit from that. Mm. The rest the rest of 990,000 would go, well, this video is shit. And they would click off within the first a minute or so. And then, and then that's just gonna kill the video. And then that a thousand people that I do want to watch will probably never know that video exists. And so I had to put it off of the platform to therefore make sure that the people that do want the actual deeper education can find it and it's a lot more accessible for them. And so that was why I made that course. And so I think I've made it for those people. It is the super fans. It is the people that do uh, want that. And so if it is the two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 people that would have the best value with when I'm able to give them the 100% education. I saw a clip recently of Tiger Woods on the golf course and he was golfing with, must have been some like barstool people or something. Mm -hmm. And this guy was like, Tiger, I keep doing this. Like I keep slicing. Can you watch my swing and tell me what to fix? Mm -hmm. And he watches it and he goes, oh, easy fix. And he's like, do this. Is there something that you see 
like if you're Tiger Woods, right? Mm -hmm. And you're watching somebody's video, what is a mistake or an easy fix that you see in amateur editors that can easily take you from amateur to pro? Maybe this is one of the philosophies that Jimmy did teach me, which is confirm the click. It is, if the title and thumbnail is this, you have to reassure that they've made the right decision. And so it's actually reiterating uh, the title and thumbnail. And that doesn't mean in this video, I'm doing this. It's like, here's why you can trust me. Here's why I can give you a good experience. And so many times I see a title and thumbnail and then the video opens with a completely different subject and completely unrelated. And so that, that to me then goes, okay, well, like there is zero correlation, zero relation to what you just promised me, I'm out. Uh, but then also part of it is then also if they're doing the over animated subtitles, I'm out. If they are shouting in the video, I'm out. If their microphone isn't got, it doesn't have good quality, I'm out. Um, I can go on for quite a while. Actually, You're like Shark Tank. You're like, yeah. and for yeah. that reason, yeah. I'm, I'm out. out. Yeah. Yep. I do. I do very much like that. Um, <laughs> oh, one of my other favorite things is uh, a lot of filmmaker YouTube channels make this mistake. They open with a cinematic wide shot. I'm out. Fuck that. It's like it's because the reason why is uh, um, so actually. The biggest mistake I do feel is the message that you do give to your audience of who is this made for. And so when I do see a cinematic drone opening shot that's not particularly related to the title and thumbnail, what that tells me is that you're prioritizing yourself as a filmmaker and showing off how good you are rather than actually telling me a good story. Uh, it is, look how, look how long I spend grading this drone shot in Da Vinci, look how cool I am. Fuck that, I'm out. That's actually probably the biggest mistake I do see. It is putting ego as a filmmaker first rather than is this actually going to be a good story and content? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've done merch, but fuck that, I'm out. Should fuck be, that, I'm out. put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on Sam Calder? Well, I didn't want to call him out directly. No, I'm <laughs> I do very much do like Sam Calder and I've, he is what I would call a vibe filmmaker. Sure. He's really great vibes and it's cool to experience that but I've never felt story with, hi buddy. I've never felt story with him, but him as a, as a vibe filmmaker, I don't know how to do any of that. Right. And so I don't really feel like I have the right to call him out on that because he's doing stuff that I don't know how to do. That's one of my big rules. If they have a talent in something, I shouldn't really be that much of a dickhead towards it. And right. so, yes, he is a phenomenal vibe filmmaker, but story, is the thing that he has that he I would like for him to improve on. I want to talk about your timeline and kind mm. of get in the nitty gritty of editing. Do you pull everything on one timeline, string out, and then you make mm. another timeline? Like what what do your timelines <laughs> look like? I use the V philosophy, the V1, V2, V3 philosophy. And so V1 is just like the string out of absolutely everything. I would then duplicate that, cut everything down to maybe the assembly. That's my V2. And then maybe then like maybe trim things down a little bit more. That's my V3. And like, I'm not doing any editing specifically just yet. I'm just trying to get down stuff that I know I'm going to use. And then this has become one of the most important steps for me that's still so hard. And I still struggle with this. I even struggled with it on the last video I was doing with Michelle. It is, can I get the story to work without me editing it? So, like, can I get can I get these shots to talk to each other? Can I get this sound bite related to this clip? Can I get can I get all of this stuff to work? Can I get the structure of the entire thing before I put in music? Before I start grading it? Before I putting in sound design? That I will spend so long doing, and then and what I would then do would be okay if I'm gonna this looks interesting. I'm gonna experiment with this idea by putting these two clips together. Let me just duplicate it and that's now our V8. Uh, okay, that didn't work. Delete, now I'm back on V7. Oh, this is a new idea. Oh, let me, this, this is, must might be a big change. Let's duplicate it. Okay, I've now got a new V8. I've tried to experiment. Oh, that works, great. And then I keep on going and then they'll be like, oh, but I, oh, but this experiment five minutes later, this is, might be a bit of a big change. Let me try this again. It's a V9, didn't work, delete. Oh, this one, this might be changed V9, that worked. And then I keep on building. So what this means is that uh, I, I always get to go back. So uh, if I, if there's some, cause it, I think we've all had that when there's something that we thought was amazing at 10 PM. And then we look back at, we look back at the next morning and go, that was fucking awful. But now <laughs> Never I get- Never happens to, to me. 
just me then. <laughs> I have such a funny example. Remember when we edited Josh Rosanne's what or the Wiz yes. music video? Yeah. So we're editing it, and there's two characters. There's him in present day mm-hmm. or at night, like finding a something baby pictures of himself. It's like a, about being young or whatever. And then there's also him DJing. Very separate, completely separate always. And then I go on a walk. Mm-hmm. I um with a friend who brought some stuff something that changed my mind a little bit about stuff come back and i'm like josh i have a fucking genius idea (laughs) i'm like this guy is pointing to the guy he's like you're celebrating each other like you're interacting now and he's like that is wild and i'm like yeah dude i'm feeling it (laughs) and and the next morning i'm like there's no way this is good look at it it's fucking great we printed it dude (laughs) but but usually i couldn't agree more usually i'm like wow that's bad or like even before bed i'll like write down like this is such a good idea and then i wake up next morning i'm like what the fuck Mm -hmm. but that yeah. one, that one hit. Yeah, I I spent t- on the last video. I spent two days on a thirty second sequence. I was in flow state. I was on fire. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> uh, and then the next day, I then went to go show it to Michelle and their director Garrett. And I can tell you, there is nothing more powerful than the feeling of shame <laughs> when you realize what you've done is garbage. <laughs> and so I was like, guys, like Michelle Garrett, this is amazing. I've changed everything. You guys ready? Let me show you just one bit. And in the second it started playing, I went, oh no, what have I done? It was like, <laughs> no. you know, it's like that mo- that final shot in Oppenheimer. And I was like, yeah. I just glazed over like, oh no, yeah. it was awful. And that clip ended and I turned to Michelle and Garrett and I just went, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't like like that was terrible. I'll delete it, you know. And I hyped it up like the day before. Oh no, that's but you're funny, right. dude. But to but to do all of this, it's like I won't get until like V12 or V15 when I have all of the story can be told by itself. Mm. Then I will then start music editing, color grading, sound design, maybe transitions. All of that stuff is the fun part. But, and we can get too excited about that. Us as editors, as filmmakers, like we get excited about doing that. But the biggest rule for me is that I have to get the story to live by itself. And then I then support it with all of these external assets and external ideas, because that can then become distracting. And then, as I said, we as filmmakers want to show off how great filmmakers we are rather than is this actually good for the story what's this new project that you're working on with michelle Mm. well i think the video as a recording hasn't been released yet and they've asked for me to keep it private okay something something you just so don't ask that yeah Yeah, Yeah. jesus thumbs thumbs right here something you said though that i think is so important that is hard for me too is like i think it's my ego if i'm just editing something say i didn't Mm. shoot it i'll edit it and i want to include one thing or a couple things that's clever Mm -hmm. to show that i was there Mm -hmm. you know what i mean which is pretty just my ego i think (laughs) and like i'll fight people and i'm like no like that was a really clever thing i did with like with the alarm clock that i like flipped Mm -hmm. through it like that was an editing trick that i did it shows that i was here and Mm -hmm. people are like no we don't need that i'm like i fight it though because it's for my ego i realize (laughs) and i'm trying to be better just serving the fucking story and not trying to show i was there Mm. it's it's look i I, that problem will never go away right but we have to be conscious of is this for my ego or is this the best thing for the film? And sometimes we forget that. So it happens every single day. Mm. It's like, rather than us saying, look how great of a filmmaker I am. Is this like, cool, those fast cuts was great for you, but it told me nothing. Right. And I think that is that's that is still for me, one of the biggest pet peeves uh, for me that I, that I still fall into that trap. We're never ever gonna lose and forget that. And so it is the discipline. Yeah, we have to be conscious of when our ego gets in front of the story. So many of these things that you're talking about, like I don't do because I don't really, I don't edit narrative style or, mm. or vlogs or anything like that. But I will say, cause you gave a specific example. I do a lot of like concert work. Mm-hmm. And when I was first starting out, um, I was filming and I was kind of just filming like the artist. Mm-hmm. And then the manager was like, your videos are probably about like 70 or 80% there. You're kind of missing like that umph or like those specific moments. And I was like, well, what is that? And then I realized I wasn't really capturing like 
the full essence of a show. So like if they're in a club, like I mm. wasn't getting any of like the textures or the mm. details, like the sparklers or like the fans or, you know, the CO2, the fire, all that kind of stuff. And so once I started capturing those details, I feel like my videos for music stuff specifically changed. It's not narrative, but like, I think it's important to capture those little details yes. when it comes to like concert stuff. The best stories are often not the actual story, but the reaction to the story. And so, yeah, I guess it is if, if the artist does a gesture cut to the fan guys go, oh my God, you know, yeah, right. that's the actual thing that we want. That's the actual real meat. So yeah, if he, do, if he does a gesture and the lights go off, cut to the wide and then like, and then, and then like hold on to that wide when everyone just, when the crowd loses their shit. Yeah, like I've never edited a concert video. Well, I think I did. I did the Holly Festival once in London and that was fun. But again, I, I mostly cut to just the crowd's yeah. reactions because that's the, because if I would assume if pe most people watching it, they are fans and so relating it to the perspective of the crowd they now get to feel like they've experienced the concert themselves it's just crazy that you can take concepts for editing mm -hmm. you know and put it into whether it's a two-hour movie a 15 minute youtube video or like a 30 second edit for instagram why do we define them as individuals sure. it's the same thing yeah it doesn't matter where you're doing it a short i would treat the shorts the same way i would treat a feature film it's like, cause bottom line, what we're doing is we're putting this subject here, a reaction towards it, cutting back to this and then another reaction. And that's all editing. It is just, it is the exact same concept across no matter what platform and distribution platform that you're using, we are all doing the exact same thing. And so of course a film editor can nerd out of a shorts editor because we are having the exact same discussions. Yeah. Give me your advice to your 18 year old self before we get out of here. I think 18 year old self had, was very insecure of where he was. And I can, and I wish I could tell him it's going to be okay. And people and the value that you see, the value that you want for yourself, you will achieve. You just have to be patient. Hayden, thank Beautiful. you so much for coming on episode 107. Make hey sure to leave us a comment, drop a subscribe, and we'll see you all next week. Peace. Peace. Peace.